Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, wherever it might be. It is my great pleasure to welcome Eduard Vilalta. He already gave an introductory talk about covering dimension of Kuhn semigroups uh, on our student seminar uh, for non commutative geometry students. And today it's for grown ups. So, uh, Eduard, the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay. So, thank you for inviting me. And as you said, I will be introducing a notion of covering dimension for Kuhn semigroups and more generally for CU semigroups. And this has been done jointly with Anne Steele. So first, before I actually define what this notion of covering dimension is, let me briefly recall what CU semigroups and Kuhn semigroups are, since these are the objects that we want to study with this notion. And the first thing that I want to introduce is that of compact containment relation. So given a partially ordered set P, where we assume that supremum of increasing sequences exist, we say that an element X is way below or compactly contained in Y if whenever Y is bounded by the supremum of an increasing sequence, then there exists some element in that sequence that actually bounds X. So X is not only bounded by the supremum of this sequence, but by one of its elements. And so in particular, X being compactly contained in Y implies that X is less than or equal to Y. And using this notion, we can define CU semigroups as follows. So we say that a positively ordered monoid is a CU semigroup if it satisfies four conditions. The first one is that every increasing sequence has a supremum. The second one is that every element is the supremum of a way below increasing sequence. So explicitly, this means that given some element X in S, then there is some sequence Zn, such that Zn is way below Zn plus one, and such that X is the supremum of that sequence. The third one is a compatibility condition, which states that if you have two pairs of way below relations, so X prime way below X and Y prime way below Y, then you will have X prime plus Y prime way below X plus Y. And the last one is once again, another compatibility condition stating that given two increasing sequences, Xn and Yn, then the supremum of the sum of these sequences is actually the sum of the supremum of the sequences. So let me give you a bunch of examples of both CU semigroups and this compact containment relation. The first being the natural numbers with infinity added. This is a CU semigroup when equipped with the usual order and addition. And by studying the order in this set, one can see that X is way below Y if only if X is finite and X is bounded by Y. Now was a second example. You can take <coughs> the non-negative extended real line and this once again, when equipped with the usual order and addition is a CU semigroup. And by studying its order, one sees that X is way below Y, even if X is strictly less than Y. And maybe the most important example, which is going to be sort of the driving reason behind everything that I will be explaining is the following one. So if you take a compact metric space, X, one says that a map from X to N bar n bar being this CU semigroup is lower semi continuous if these sets are open for each n in n bar, where, well, these sets are the sets of points x in x such that f of x is greater or equal to n. And it turns out that if you take the set of all such maps, which is denoted as LCC of x n bar, this becomes a CU semigroup with the pointwise order and addition. And while well, doing the same as in here, one can actually characterize this compact containment or way below relation by the following. So F is way below G, F and G being a lower semi-continuous functions, even if F is finite value, so the supremum of F is finite. And these sets, which are open by definition, are compactly contained in these other sets for each N in N bar. And note that in these settings, so the setting of compact metric spaces, this is exactly the same as saying that the closure of this set is inside this one. In particular, this implies that if you have two open subsets, say U and B, 
then the indicator function of u is way below the indicator function of b, even only if u is compactly contained in b. Sorry, I, I'm a little bit confused why you assume that your functions have values in uh, natural numbers extended by infinity and not real values. Well, because it's just one construction. So if you assume that, that the values are real and also with the infinity added, so zero infinity, this will yeah. also be a single semi group. But okay. yeah, yeah, but so, and in fact, you can put here a CU semi group, any CU semi group. And if you, if you assume that X is also um, <coughs> separable, then LCC of XS is going to be a CU semi group as well. As you mentioned, that this would be. Uh the most important example so you meant uh, yes. lower semi-continuous maps into some cu semi-group but not necessarily no 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 n, so yes the, the example that i'm going to use is precisely this one so lcc of x and bar uh, n bar okay. okay yeah yeah so even though this can be like generalized for not just n bar but other cu semi-groups like the one that's actually important today is this one for, okay for some parts of the talk okay thank you and well, let me just remind you that, so this is the indicator function, which is by construction lower semi continuous. And sort of the reason why this is called compact containment is precisely because of this equivalence. Okay, so having said that, also if you have two CU semi ropes, one can, of course, construct a notion of morphism between them. So we say that a monoid morphism between two CU semi ropes is a CU morphism if it preserves order supreme of increasing sequences and the compact containment relation. So if, if it preserves most of the symbols that we usually use when working with CU semi -ropes. Okay, so why do we study CU semi -ropes or why do we consider CU semi -ropes and CU morphisms? Well, it turns out that for any sister algebra A, one can use the positive elements in its stabilization to define a CU semi group, which is known as the Kuhn semi group of A. So the definition is as follows If you have two positive elements in A, we say that A is Kuhn superquivalent to B if A is the limit of such elements, where Rn is a sequence in A. And one can check that this is a superquivalence. So using it, we can define an equivalence relation, which is defined as follows. So A is Kuhn's equivalent to B, whenever A is super equivalent to B and B is super equivalent to A. And now since this is an equivalence relation, we can, we can quotient things out like this. And the Kuhn semi group of A, which is denoted by CU of A, is defined as the positive elements in the stabilization of A modulo this equivalence relation. And if we equip this with the ordering used by the Kuhn supercoherence and the addition induced by the diagonal addition, this becomes a positive reordered monad. Where by induce, what I mean is that a class of a positive element A is going to be less than or equal to B, even if by definition A is supercoherent to B. So, as I said, such a construction leads to a CU semi group, by which I mean that those four conditions are satisfied. And not only that, but whenever one has a star homomorphism from a sister algebra to another one, then this star homomorphism induces a CU morphism between the Kuhn semi groups. And even though I've decided to define first CU semi groups and then Kuhn semi groups, I should probably mention that this is backwards in, in a chronological sense. So the first thing that was defined was the Kuhn semigroup, and then Coward, Elliot, and Ivanescu defined CU semigroups and CU morphisms and proved this theorem. And well, just to give you some examples of Kuhn semigroups, the Kuhn semigroup of the complex numbers is n bar, which is a CU semigroup that we've already studied. The Kuhn semigroup of the jason Rasak algebra is precisely the non-negative extended real line Sorry, could you repeat the second example? What is W? The J. Selon Razak algebra. Mm. Yeah? No. Okay. Uh, 
And well, the third example is if you have a compact metric space, then the Kunzen group of the continuous functions over X is LCC of X and bar whenever the dimension is no greater than one. So these are just some examples of, of Kunzen groups. So now let's move on to the actual definition of, of the covering dimension for Kunzen groups. And I think that the best way to, to think of it is as an abstraction or a generalization of the notion of Lebesgue covering dimension for compact metric spaces. So first, let me recall the following um, characterization of, of such a dimension. Given a natural number n and some compact metric space x, the dimension of x is no greater than n, even if for every open cover, which we may assume to be finite because we are in the compact setting, there exist open subsets bjk, where the j's go from one to r, are being the number of open subsets in the case from zero to n, n being the, the bound on the dimension, such that three conditions are satisfied. So the first one is that bjk is compactly contained in uj. The second one is that x is still covered by the bjk's. So one and two are simply saying that the bjk's are an refinement of the original cover. And the third condition is that the bjk's are disjoint on j. So more explicitly, bjk is disjoint with bj prime k whenever j is different than j prime. And this happens for each case. And usually, uh, let's say that the short version of, of stating this theorem is that a compact metric space has dimension no greater than n, even if every open cover has a subcover with an n plus one coloric, the colors being the possible values of k, which are n plus one because we start at zero. So now the idea to define this notion of covering dimension for say your semi groups is to take this result and say, well, we know that for each compact metric space, there is a CU semi that has that compact metric space inside it, which is LCC of X and bar. And so what we'll try to do is to translate this theorem to LCC of X and bar. And we want the translation to be stated only with the usual symbols of CU semi which is the addition, the usual order, and the way below relation. So I will do this in two steps. First, I will get rid of, let's say, the, the topological operations, so the union, the compact containment, and the intersections. And then in a second step, I will get rid of all the topological subsets, or of all the open subsets. And well, this will be clear in a second. So take a compact metric space where we do not assume anything on the dimension. And take some family of open subsets, where once again, these have no relation with the previous theorem. These are any open subsets. Then that these families are a cover for X is exactly the same as saying that these holds in LCC of X and bar. So G of X is way below G of X because X is compact and so it's compactly containing itself. So that's why we have this. And this is simply because this is a cover. And conversely, it's also easy to see that if one has this, then this must be a cover, this family of open subsets. So that's the first translation. We've translated what it means to be a cover in terms of, let's say, sums and way below relations, but we still have the open subsets. Now, a second translation is something that I've already mentioned, which is that an open subset UI is compactly contained in UJ, even only if the indicator function of ui is way below the indicator function of uj. And finally, the third translation that we made is that this family has disjoint, uh, pairwise disjoint sets, even if the sum of the indicator functions of the family are way below g of x. And for instance, to see this, if we assume that this is satisfied, then for any point x in x, we know that this sum is going to be bounded by one. So only one of these indicator functions is one, at most only one of these. So it follows. May, yes. yeah. May I just ask a question? Uh, yeah, in the first bullet, mm -hmm. this one part, yes, you have uh, chi x way mm -hmm. uh, beyond, below, uh, mm -hmm. 
below uh, chi x. What's right. the what's the role of this? Uh... Right. This this is so, so this is not needed, but it's it's sort of redundant, if you will, because we are assuming x to be compact. But it, it just so that the, the actual statement of dimension will have like sort of two elements here. But yeah, so, so you're right. Um, to translate this, let's say, you don't need this first part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, <clears throat> as I've said, we've now sort of translated some of these statements, but we still have the open substance. So, in other words, what we have now is that given some natural number n, the dimension of x is no greater than n, even if whenever one has this, which is the same as saying that the open subsets cover x, there exists some elements, which are chi of pjk, such that the indicator function is way below the indicator function of the uj, which again, this is the same as saying that the bjk is compactly contained in uj. <coughs> this is bounded by the sum of all the indicator functions of bjk, and finally, the sum only on j of the corresponding indicator functions is way below chi of x for each k. So as I've said, this is sort of an intermediate translation where we've gotten rid of unions, intersections, and, and containments, but we still have open subsets. And so now one might ask if it's possible to actually generalize this, and this is indeed true. And so we get that in a compact metric space, the dimension of x is no greater than n, even if whenever we have this sort of formula, where now these elements are not indicator functions, but any sort of lower semi-continuous map from x to n bar, there exist elements that jk with the same indices, such that jk is way below yj for j and k, x prime is way below the sum of all these edge case, and the sum only on j of these edge case is way below x for each k. So this sort of answers what you were asking about chi of x being way below chi of x. So this is simply to, to compare this to the actual general statement, where instead of x and x, we have x prime and x, which need uh, do not need to be the same. And Note in particular that this is indeed a generalization of this by simply taking x prime and x to be chi of x and yj to be chi of yj. And <clears throat> what's really important about this statement, at least for what we want to do, is that if you take out this first sentence and also the first half of this sentence, so if you start reading things at whatever, this is a property that can be stated for any serial semi loop. It, it might or might not be satisfied in a serial semi loop. But this is something that one can study in any serial semi loop, since the only thing that we are using are additions, way belows, and that's it. So we define our notion of covering dimension by simply copying this. So given a serial semi loop S and some natural number N, to say that the dimension of S is bounded by N. If whenever one has such a formula, there exists some elements set jk, such that set jk is way below yj for each j and k. X prime is way below the sum on j and k of these edge jk's, and the sum only on j of these edge jk's is way below x. And as is usually done in this sort of definitions, the dimension of s is said to be infinite if we cannot find such an n. And otherwise, we get the dimension of S to be the smallest and satisfying this. So um, something that I forgot to mention at the beginning is that since this is a, is a non-commutative geometry seminar, I will be stating most of the results in terms only of Kuhn semi loops. So um, I will only rarely state things for CU semi loops, and I will be stating them for Kuhn semi loops of system algebras. So I will either state things directly for the Kuhn semi loop of a system algebra, or whenever I state things for CU semi loops, I will quickly translate them to Kuhn semi loops of system algebra. So, okay. 
Um, now, having said this, once one has this definition, there are three main things that one can do, which are sort of the tables of contents of this talk. So first, one can study general properties of dimensional S, where once again, one can think of S as the full sum group of a sister algebra. One can also study properties of the dimension of the function group of a sister algebra. And more explicitly, um, one wants to find relations between this notion of dimension and other dimensionality notions that one might have. And finally, it's also interesting to see if this assignment, so sending A to the dimension of its function group, is a non-commutative dimension theory in a sense that I will explain once we reach this point. So, okay, let's start with the first block, which is to talk about general properties. And before jumping directly to the permanence properties of this notion of dimension, let me just mention that there are two really interesting ways of thinking about this notion of calling dimension. The first one is the one that I've used to introduce it. So thinking of it as, as an analog or as a generalization of Lebesgue's covering dimension for a compact metric space. And the other one is to think of it as a measurement of how much reads the composition the CU semigroup or Kuhn semigroup has. So recall that in a positive reorder monoid, we say that the monoid has reads the composition if whenever X is bounded by a finite sum, then X is actually, can actually be written as a sum where each element in this sum is bounded by one of the original elements in the sum. And by using a, a rather straightforward inductive argument, one can see that the dimension of S is zero, even only if whenever one has this, so X prime way below X below this sum, then one can find elements ZJ way below YJ such that this sum is not x, but is between x prime and x. And since we can take elements x prime arbitrarily close to x, one can think of the dimension being zero as something that's really close to having fit the composition. So it's not equivalent, but it's fairly close. And so looking at things in this way, let's say that dimension is zero could also be seen as having almost fit the composition and dimension of S being infinity could be seen as having no reach the composition at all. So thinking in this way informally, if we have a large enough subset in a CU semigroup having reached the composition, then the semigroup will have dimension zero. And formally, um, this is stated as follows. So if you have a CU semigroup and there is some sub semigroup that has reached the composition, and such a semigroup is large enough in the sense that every element of S is the supremum of an increasing sequence in F, then the dimension of S is zero. But once again, the way to read this is simply that if you have a large enough subset which reads the composition, then the dimension will be zero. And for example, one can apply this to see that N bar has dimension zero, so the Kuhn semigroup C has dimension zero because the natural numbers have read the composition. Also, the CU semigroup of only two elements, zero and infinity, has once again dimension zero because of the same reason. And the Kuhn semigroup of the J. Sarkasak algebra, which is the same as the non negative extended real line, also has dimension zero because the non negative real numbers without infinity have reached the composition. So it follows that this has dimension zero as well. Okay. So now I will, as I said, quickly state the properties for CU semigroups, but in a second I will translate them to sister algebra. I'm sorry, uh, Edward, yeah. may I ask you some completely naive, unprofessional questions? No, no, go ahead. If you could go back to the previous yeah. slide. It's just this about one. the intuition. Uh, when I read you, uh, your, your proposition, this one, yeah. I, I, I begin to worry that I take um, my S uh, CU semigroup, okay? Mm -hmm. And when I determine uh, 
Ah, I see what my problems. I didn't realize that every element of S is the supreme. So you cannot choose this F to be too small. Okay. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, I missed this, this, uh, that every element of S. I read that every element of F. And I. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. No, no. So, okay. yes. So, as I said, you need F to be really large. Instead of approximate. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. No problem. So, well, the three main permanence properties are the following ones. So if you have two CU setups, then the dimension of the direct sum is going to be the maximum of the dimensions. If you have a CU semigroup and an ideal, then the dimension of the ideal and the corresponding quotient are going to both be bounded by the dimension of S. And if you have an inductive limit of CU semigroups, then the dimension of S is bounded by the limit of the dimensions. And as I said, here is the translation for system algebras. So given two system algebras A and B, the dimension of the Kunze group of the direct sum is the maximum of the dimensions of the Kunze groups. For an ideal in the system algebra, then the dimension of the Kunze group of the ideal and of the corresponding quotient is also bounded by the dimension of the Kunze group of A. And if you have some inductive limit of system algebras, then the dimension of the Kunze group of A is bounded by the limit of the dimensions of the Kunze groups. So these are three really useful properties that one always wants to have in any sort of, of dimensionality notion, since they allow you to, if not compute, at least bound the dimension of certain system algebras. And even though these are useful, there are still things that we do not know. So for instance, we do not know if this holds. So we know that for every ideal of a system algebra, the dimension of its constant group and the dimension of the corresponding quotient will both be bounded by the dimension of C of A. But we do not know if the dimension of the Kunze group of A can be somehow bounded as a combination, sort of, of the dimension of the Kunze group of the ideal and the corresponding quotient. So we do not know if this holds, which is the usual bound in nuclear dimension, but we do not have any bound, not just this one. So you just said that it does hold for the nuclear dimension, right? Yes. So okay. for, for the nuclear dimension, this is what one has. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, do we have the same thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I should say that the question is more general. It's, it's not that we don't know if this holds. We do not know if there is an actual bound using an ideal and a quotient. And even in the case of the minimal unitization, we also do not know. So we don't know if the dimension of the Kunze group of the minimal unitization of a system algebra is bounded by the corresponding dimension plus one, which is which like, is a special case of what exactly, you have. Exactly, which is let's say the, the easiest case probably. Mm -hmm. So those are some properties that we have, and another interesting property is that one can actually study in certain scenarios the covering dimension of the Kunze group by looking at certain special elements of, of the algebra. So in a general CU semigroup, but once again, you can think of this as the Kuhn semigroup of a system algebra, a non-zero element is said to be soft if whenever x prime is equal to x, you can find some non-zero t such that x prime plus t is equal to x. So this is just, a, let's say, a particular or, or a special class of elements in any CU semigroup, and in particular Kuhn semigroup. Kunze groups. So we denote the set of soft elements by S soft. And under certain conditions, which as I said before, I will quickly translate to the language of Kunze groups, one can see that the dimension of S of any CU semigroup is bounded below by the dimension of its soft elements and above by the dimension of its soft elements plus one. And in terms of sister algebras, what this implies is that if you have a simple stable rank one sister algebra, then the dimension of these soft elements in the Kunze group is a lower bound by the dimension of the Kunze group. And again, this is bounded by the dimension of the Kunze group of a soft plus one. And just as an example where this can be useful, let me compute the, the dimension of the Kunze group of the Jiangsu algebra. So the soft part of the Kunze group of the Jiangsu algebra can be seen if one studies this Kunze group to be the same as the Kunze group of the jason rasak algebra, which is zero infinity. And so since we know that this is 
that this has dimension zero, then the dimension of the quantum group of the Jiangsu algebra is between zero or one. And by doing a study of this quantum group, one can actually see that it is one, so it cannot be zero. But since I haven't introduced or at least given an, a definition of what this is, I will revisit this example later and show that the dimension can indeed not be zero by using some other results. So, I'm sorry, I don't understand yeah. this calculation. I mean, I understand. The, <laughs> where did you get this 0 0.6, 0 0.6 from? Right, right, right. So, I I was planning sort of to get away with this <laughs> because I, I haven't given like a proper, uh, let's say, C U semi uh, that's like C of Z. Right? So we. On Friday, I, I did give one, but not today. So if one knows what this is, then this shows that dimension is not zero. But if one doesn't, then, as I said, in like, I would say 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I will be giving another proof that this cannot be zero. So it's one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it means that what? That it's one, right? Yes, that is one, exactly. So it's either zero or one, and there is a way. And I will show another way of showing that it's not zero. So it's one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. So, well, finally, let me just briefly mention that if you have a sister algebra that has some sort of tensorial absorption, so for instance, if it absorbs the Jason plus act tensorially, or, or if it's set stable, then one can say some things about its Kunsen group. And well, this is known as R multiplication, which I'm not going to introduce, but using the fact that the Kunsen groups of W stable or Z stable sister algebras have certain properties, one can say things about their covering dimensions. So given sister algebra A, if A is purely infinite, then the dimension of its Kunsen group is zero. If A is W stable, then the dimension of its Kunsen group is also zero. And if A is Z stable, then the dimension of its Kunsen group is always bounded by one. And do note that in here, I'm not assuming simplicity or any other thing. So directly, if you have a Z-stable system algebra, then its dimension is going to be bounded by one. So Sorry, are... purely infinite means uh, in the Murray von Neumann sense, yes? Uh, what the... it means? Well, there Maybe are a bunch infinite. of equivalences, but either that, that every element is properly infinite, so that mm. x di diagonally added with x is equivalent to x. So if, if you will, um, you can take as a definition that A is purely infinite if its Kuhn semigroup is idempotent. So every element, two times every element is still the same element. Oh, okay, so. Not two times. All right? this, so all this times, defined right? in, the, in this term of disordering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thanks. So as I was saying, if we have certain terms or products, then we can say things about the dimension. But we don't know generally what happens with a, a, a general tensor product. So if you have the dimension of the quantum group of a tensor product of two sister algebras, we don't know what this is. So we don't know if there is some sort of bound like the one that one has in the case of nuclear dimension, right? which would be this one. So these uh, we also don't know. So, okay, this sort of finishes the first block of the talk, which was about general permanence properties of, of Kuhn semigroups and Sigur semigroups. And we now move to the relation of this dimension to other uh, notions of dimension in sister algebras. And maybe the main result is that even any sister algebra, the dimension of its Kuhn semigroup is always bounded by the nuclear dimension of the sister algebra. And we have both results or examples where this is actually an equality. And we also have other examples where these two numbers are as far apart as they can be. So we have examples where this is zero and this is infinity. And well, Sorry, just, may I ask yeah. a question? Yeah, yeah. So if you have uh, many examples with uh, strict inequality, mm -hmm. so why do you expect on the previous page? Yeah. If you come back, why do you expect this inequality, which is 
Oh, right, right. Limiting this inequality for uh, nuclear. No, dimension. no, yeah, you are totally. So this is, let's say, just like an example. So we we would want, like, let's say, a bound of this, maybe not by this, by but by some combination of the dimension of the Kunzian group of A. Ah, different than this. Yeah, yeah. So this is just okay. say, in the case of nuclear dimension, one has this. So maybe yes. we can have, let's say, some sort of bound of the dimension of the tensor product by the dimension of of the Kunzian group of its sister algebra. Mm -hmm. but we, okay. so, yes. Thank you. We do not have any counterexample to this, but it's not like we are actually expecting this to happen. Thanks. So, okay. As I said, um, we both had examples of of, thing, of this being an actual equality and also this being a strict inequality. And so let's go first to, to the case where we have an equality. So for instance, if you have a compact house of space, then the dimension of x is the dimension of CU of C of x. So previously we had the dimension of LCC of x in bar was the dimension of x. But now in the case of Kuhn's and groups, we also have the same. So for compact house of spaces, this is actually the dimension of x, which once again sort of justifies the naming of this dimension as the covering dimension of the Kuhn groups. And for well, locally compact house of spaces, then this is also true, but you have to put the local dimension in here and you have to add a zero here, but this still holds. And using this general result, one can see that for a subhomogeneous sister algebra, then both dimensions also agree. So for this class of system algebras, we do have an equality. But as I said, there are plenty of system algebras where this is a strict inequality. And just as an example of, of some of those system algebras, let me mention that for a real rank zero system algebra, the dimension of each function group is always zero. And so- What does it mean, a real rank zero? The, the definition of real rank zero. Yes. That the self-adjoint invertible elements are dense in the self-adjoint elements. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks. So, <clears throat> so well, going back to, to the second, let's say, interpretation of this notion of covering dimension, if one thinks of this dimension as the measurement of how much the composition one has, and it should be at least informally clear that this has to happen. Because if you have real rank zero, then the murray von neumann semi group inside CU of A has reached the composition and is large enough because you have plenty of projections. So then the dimension is zero. And that's actually sort of the proof. And we also have a quick converse for this. So for a unital stable rank one system algebra, the dimension of the Kuhn semi group is zero, even only if A is of real rank zero. So in this case, this is actually an equivalent. So using these two results, we can produce examples where that inequality is actually strict. So for instance, if you take B of L2 of N, the dimension of the Kunzen group is zero because it has real rank zero, but the nuclear dimension of A is infinity. So this is one out of many examples, right? If you take any non-nuclear real rank zero system algebra, um, you will get examples where the dimension of the Kunzen group is zero and the nuclear dimension is infinity. And now I promised that I would revisit the computation of the Kunzen group of this Yangsu algebra. So first, um, another way of, of seeing that this dimension can only be zero or one is using the, bound, the nuclear dimension bound. So the dimension of the Kunzen group of the Yangsu algebra is bounded by the nuclear dimension of the same system algebra, which is one. Now, using that the Jiangsu algebra is a unital stable rank one system algebra, one sees that it cannot possibly have dimension zero, because then by this proposition, it would have real rank zero, which it doesn't. So it follows that the dimension is not one, and since it's bounded, I mean, it's, it's not zero, and since the dimension is bounded by one, then the dimension is one. So these are some cases where one can compute the, di the dimension, and there are also other system algebras where we can characterize what it means to have dimension zero. So first, for a separable simple set stable system algebra, 
we have by the simple fact that a is z stable that the dimension is bounded by one so it's the dimension is always going to be either zero or one and dimension zero is exactly the same as a having real rank zero or a being a stably projectionless so in a sense to have dimension zero is produces some sort of dichotomy so either a has plenty of projections which is the same as saying that it has real rank zero or a is stably projectionless so it has no projections now looking at this a question which i believe that it's really interesting to look into is that if one has a simple unit of sister algebra then the nuclear dimension of a can only be zero one or infinity so our question is what are the possible values of the dimension of c u of a in in this setting in the setting of simple unit of sister algebras we know that zero is is a possible value for instance if you take a of real rank zero then this is zero and we also know that that one can also be achieved for instance by the jiangsu algebra but we do not know if there is some system algebra such that this is say two or three or four or something like that so let me just mention I'm sorry do you know any example uh, when this dimension is infinite um, coming from a sister algebra I don't know if we have so if it if it's just a CU semi group like um generally there are CU semi groups that are not quantum semi groups so if you take a CU semi group um, well, some particular ones then one can see that dimension infinity can actually happen for CU oh, no, but I'm interested in sister algebra yeah, yeah of course I, I don't know if we I don't think that we have one no mm -hmm. okay so so this is open yes exactly so generally other than zero or one we do not know anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i see thank you so for instance we don't know if a is billet and we don't know what this is for example so <clears throat> now let me just mention briefly something about this dichotomy which is that of dimension zero being the same in at least in this case of either having plenty of projections or having none so in the setting where we have plenty of projections, which is this one, one can see that every element of C of A is the supremum of elements that are way below themselves, which are known as compact elements. And in any Kuhn semi group um, of a sister algebra of real rank zero or not, such elements, so elements that are way below themselves, actually satisfy that they can be complemented in the sense that if x is way below y, then x plus c is actually equal to y. But it turns out that there are usually far more elements that can be complemented than elements that satisfy this. So one says that an element is complementable in a CU semi group or a Kuhn semi group if y is equal to x plus c and whenever x is way below y. And in the case of that a is stable projectionless, so whenever one does not have any projections it turns out that having dimension zero is still the same as all the elements being the supremum but not of elements of this form but now of elements that are complementable so this is sort of a, a deeper study in this in this dimension zero case now having said this let me move on to the on to the last block of the talk which is studying when oops, when this assignment is a non-commutative dimension theory which i will now define but the, the assignment is sending each sister algebra to the dimension of its function group so <clears throat> what this is asking is if six properties are satisfied for this assignment d so the first one we already know that it's true which is that the dimension of an ideal is always bounded by the dimension of a sister algebra. The second one, which we also know to be true, is that the dimension of the quotient is bounded by the dimension of the sister algebra. The third one, which again we know that holds, is that the dimension of the direct sum of two sister algebras is the maximum of the dimensions. 
now come three properties which we still haven't studied. I mean, I will now study them, but not on, so we haven't studied them in this presentation. That's what that's what I meant. So the fourth one is whether or not if this holds. So if the dimension of the minimal unitization is the same as the dimension of a, which as you can probably imagine by some of the questions, um, is it actually false? The fifth one is that if a is approximated by some sister subalgebras a lambda inside of a, such that the dimension of each a lambda is bounded by n, then the dimension of a also has to be bounded by n. And the last one is to study if for every several sister subalgebra in a, one can find a bigger separable sister subalgebra such the dimension of b is bounded by that of a. And so we will now study what happens with these last three properties for, for this assignment. And just as a remark, note that, for instance, other dimensionality notions, such as real rank, stable rank, or nuclear dimension, do satisfy all of these six properties. So, okay. Sorry, could we go back to this? Yeah, I'm a little bit puzzled by the, by the last condition since mm -hmm. in the context of sister algebra, mm -hmm. if you view a sister algebra theory as a non-commutative topology to the fact that something is a subalgebra, it corresponds to the epimorphism on, the, uh, on this uh, geometric top topological side. So, so why do we expect that this equality would hold? No, well, Am I, I right or right, I'm, inequality? I'm not saying that this holds. I, all I'm saying is that so this is a condition that one might want. So mainly that the this the sister uh, subalgebra, the separable sister subalgebras inside the sister algebra that satisfy this property are somehow dense. In in mm -hmm. the sense that whenever one has another one, maybe this one does not satisfy that its dimension is bounded by the dimension of the sister algebra. Ah, okay, so to find a larger one. So it could not. Um, uh, it is possible that it would, wouldn't happen for B zero. But the condition is that yes, yes, find precisely. Something yes, yes. larger. So you you might find several sister subalgebras, say B zero, such that this does not hold for B zero. Yes, exactly, and that was uh, that was my point. So you can find those examples even in the commutative case. Yes, am mm -hmm. I right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. So what you're asking for is, is mm -hmm. if you can find a, a larger one, so one containing it that does have this property. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay. May I say something? Yeah, yeah, sure. So it is uh, motivated though by something from uh, classical topology. So if you have a, a huge space which is not metrizable, which has some dimension, say dimension five, and you have an epimorphism to a metrizable space, which could have any dimension, right? I mean, as you said, uh, an epimorphism, the dimension may go up, right? Yeah, exactly, to... exactly. That's what I'm going to But you will be able to find another metrizable space of dimension at most five, as such that your, your map factors to that. And so this is sometimes called Nadeshik factorization theorem. So that it's a classical result uh, from dimension theory of topological spaces. And D6 is kind of the translation you turn every error around and uh, uh, to the setting of system algebra. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Okay. So now I, I did say in, in the abstract that I was going to define what this means, but I, I ultimately, since we are focusing on, on Kunze groups, I will not actually explain this. I, I will give the definition very quickly and I will leave it here in case that someone's interested. But let me just mention that what, what we try to capture when we define a family that approximates S is somehow a notion where the S lambdas are, let's say, dense in S, and in such a way that if enough S lambda satisfies some property, then S will also satisfy the property. So again, I'm going to skip this fairly quickly, but I'm I will leave it here in case that someone wants to see it. 
And now using this, this notion of approximation, one can see that for a serious semigroup, if this serious semigroup is approximated by a family of serious semigroups, then the dimension of mass is bounded by the supremum of those dimensions. And so recall that in the setting of sister algebras, a sister algebra is approximated by a collection of sisters of algebras. If for finally many elements, A1, An, and some positive epsilon, one can actually find a lambda and some elements in the lambda, such that Bj and Aj are at distance at most epsilon for J. So the notion of approximation for CU semigroups is sort of defined so that the following result ha happens. So if you have an approximation in, in the sense of sister algebras, then this gives you an approximation of Kuhn semigroups or CU semigroups more generally. And so using this lemma and this proposition, what one gets is that if you have a sister algebra approximated by some sister subalgebras A lambda in A, then the dimension of its Kuhn semigroup is always going to be bounded by the supremum of the dimension of the Kuhn semigroups of the sister subalgebras. So this shows that one of those three conditions is satisfied, those three remaining conditions. So this is D5. Now, one can also check that D6 is satisfied. So given some sister algebra A and some N such that the dimension of the constant group of A is bounded by N, then the following holds, which is precisely that, that condition. So for every several sister subalgebra D0 in A, we can find a larger sister subalgebra, which is also separable, and such that the dimension of its constant group is bounded by N. So combining the previous two results, we see that in order to study the dimension of the Kunzan group of a sister algebra, one only needs to look at its several sister subalgebras. So the dimension of a Kunzan group of a sister algebra is bounded by N, even only if every finite subset of A is containing a several sister subalgebra satisfying the required condition. So as I've mentioned, We now know that this assignment, sending each sister algebra to the dimension of its Kuhn semigroup, satisfies five out of those six conditions. And it turns out that the remaining condition, which is the one about minimal limitations, is Sorry, not satisfied. Could you come yeah. back to the previous page? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, did you say that, that uh, to consider this dimension of uh, Q of A, mm -hmm. C U of A, is it enough to, to, to restrict uh, yourself to separable algebras? Mm -hmm. in, in the, in, but in even this... if you have, if you, even if you have uh, uh, this uh, uh, dimension Q of B uh, not, not greater than M, it, it says nothing about uh, real dimension of, of this uh, dim dimension of CU of A, because this, this is only an inequality. Well, yes, so that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bound the dimension. Yeah, yes, exactly. So one can bound the dimension. Yeah, yes. You have okay, to, to bound, right. yeah, not yeah, to compute yeah. it. Okay. No, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. You are completely right. Okay. So one can bound the dimension. Yeah. Yeah, yes. No, I agree. Okay, thank you. So, well, I, as I was mentioning, there is one condition which we still have to study, and this turns out to not be satisfied. So, given, for instance, the Jason and Rasak algebra, if one considers its unitization, then this is an stable rank one unital sister algebra. But its real rank is not zero. So it follows that its dimension cannot be zero. And one can actually see by using the, the nuclear dimension bound that it is one. So here is an example of a sister algebra where the dimension of its Kuhn semigroup is zero, but the dimension of the Kuhn semigroup of its unitization is not the same. And in this case, it's one. So I wanted to finish this talk with another problem, which is, well, what happens if we try to fix this? So directly, what happens if we consider, instead of sending A to the dimension of its Kunzen group, sending A to the dimension of the Kunzen group of its minimal, uh, I mean, its minimal unitization? And clearly, this by construction satisfies D4. 
but no one has to check all the other properties. And so this is another investor of the problem. And that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions because you you, you finished 35 minutes too early. Oh, sorry. sorry. When I practiced, I promised that it was far longer. So, so I, I would uh, strongly suggest that you give us some examples of what we're talking about. We have plenty of time. Yeah, sure. So you mean of, of, the, of this dimension or? Yeah. Anything that you can exemplify, uh, you can you know use a whiteboard to to write something, improvise. That would be great, spontaneous. <laughs> Hans, uh, Hannes can add. <laughs> <laughs> so let me then stop sharing and then yeah. share again. Um, That there aren't when, when it comes to actual examples, there aren't that many left, sadly. So well, the, there are a few. Sorry? Well, as we take the Cantor set, we take continuous functions on the Cantor set. That's a commutative system. Mm -hmm. so what, what is the Kunz semigroup for that? And what, what, what is the dimension of the Kunz semigroup? Well, you still have dimension zero, right? Of the commutative over the Cantor set. Well, I would think zero. Yeah, I would, I would. yeah, yeah be, because so. You can still use, oh, I'm not sharing now. Um, let me, okay, share this. In general, for, in general, in the commutative, if we have a commutative C star algebra, <coughs> so yeah, what, you, what is the dimension have, of Now oh, I need to find it, but, um, so you still have this right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for any compact house or space, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but what, what do you mean by dimension of X? What, covering dimension. The, the covering, covering dimension. dimension. The covering, covering dimension. dimension. Yeah. I see. Okay. Right. So I suppose we take a Lie group. We take the reduced C star algebra. Let's say a Lie group. Then what I, happens? Then I don't know what happens. Do you know? Um, this might be some interesting cases. There are discrete groups mm -hmm. which are not exact, mm -hmm. right? right? Um, these were these are constructed using expander graphs. Those are the only known examples, the, the ones involving expander graphs. This would be an interesting case. So you take um, you take let's say the reduced Easter algebra of such such a non-exact discrete group. This would, I think, would be interesting to know what 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 is you know, what's the dimension of that. In general, for a discrete group, what, what is what, what you take its reduced Easter algebra? Let's say, mm -hmm. what uh, what is the dimension? I, I will certainly look into this. I so I, I don't know, but I will look into it. Yeah. Uh, can I say something about? Go the, ahead. Go ahead. Of course. Yeah. If, if you have a Lie group and it, let's say uh, it's type one, so the let's say connected Lie group. Uh, then in the type one case, uh, I mean, exactly that in the bottom of the slide is actually the result for a subhomogeneous system. So in that case, um, the dimension of the Kunzmi group is the nuclear dimension. And this then is just the kind of the covering dimension of the primitive ideal space. Of mm -hmm. course, you have to be a little bit careful exactly how to define the dimension of the primitive ideal space if it's not housed off. Mm -hmm. um, but in, so in principle, it's something like that. Um, of course, if you, if you look at discrete groups uh, and then I think things get much more complicated, I think. I mean, even for C star simple groups, right? when the reduced group C star algebra is uh, simple, it's a little bit tricky. I guess for the free group on infinitely many generators, this is one example where we know it. Um, then the dimension is one because actually the the free group of infinitely many generators generators has the same constant group as the junk through algebra it's one of these surprising results but um so 
you computed the dimension of the Jiangsu algebra, the consumer group is one. Mm -hmm. And then, so this gives you the free group with infinitely many generators as well. But already, if you look at the free group with only finitely many generator, generators, so F2, uh, we don't know exactly what the result is because we don't know what the consumer group is. So we don't know exactly what the dimension is. Um, but I agree that it would be very interesting <laughs> to look into this, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Are there some other classes of uh, sister algebras? I mean, beyond uh, commutative and now um, convolution sister algebras of uh, groups uh, that you can say something about uh, computability of uh, uh, this um, dimension of a, of a cons uh, semi group. For instance, uh, when uh, we motivated by the Rockman dimension, we introduced a local triviality dimension for dynamical systems, for quantum dynamical systems. Uh, we got quite a bit of help by studying uh, dynamical systems coming from gauge actions on graph sister algebras. I don't think that other than the classes that I presented here, we, we have anything else. So, I mean, concrete. Mm -hmm. And and I understand that in general, this is very difficult to, to really compute such. Well, so so the issue partly is because the, the quincent group itself is hard to compute. So yeah. the, the dimension is presumably maybe easier because you are mm -hmm. not looking at the whole quincent group, but just at one of its properties, but still something that, that tends to be hard. But of course, using these relations, one can always say something about it. For which C star algebras is this dimension of the Kuntz semigroup equal to covering dimension of the primitive ideal space? Is that very widely true? Is I mean, is that a general, how general is that principle? It's just for, for homogeneous C star algebras, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I would think it's mostly for type one algebras. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, you think that's a type one? Uh -huh. I mean, it, the, the theorem that's actually presented there is definitely true for subhomogeneous algebras. And this already shows that, I mean, computing the Kunzmi group of subhomogeneous algebras, that's extremely difficult. I mean, it's virtually impossible. I mean, you take, uh, I mean, for one dimensional spaces, we can still do it. For some two dimensional spaces, we can do it. But as soon as the dimension of the space uh, is bigger than three, uh, the Kunzmi group is unmanageable because it contains information about all projections on closed subsets. So you, you have uh, closed subsets that are spheres and you have bot projections, you have higher bot projections. So th that's all encoded in the Kunzmi group. It's very, very complicated, but then the dimension becomes very simple, right? We can compute the dimension, the formula is there. Uh, so this kind of second level invariant, I mean, you know, you associated to the CC algebra, it's Kunzmi group, which is complicated, but then you associate it to the Kunzmi group, just the dimension, the second level invariant actually becomes much easier. And for instance, in this case, it's very computable. Uh, it's the nuclear dimension, and the nuclear dimension is really just the covering dimension of the primitive ideal space. And then beyond that, for instance, if you look at Simple C star algebras, right? I mean, simple C star algebras, the primitive ideal space is just a point. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think in any sense, right? A point is, is zero dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, but the dimension of the quantum group of a simple C star algebra does not have to be zero. So, I mean, simple C star algebras are like non commutative points, and their dimension can be non zero in, in the sense of the dimension of the quantum group. So there they don't agree. Thank you, very good, thank you. And in what sense having, uh, or in what applications you would have uh, 
um, some help by, by knowing and having the theory of uh, this dimension of a Kuhn semigroup that you wouldn't get just by knowing uh, the nuclear dimension. So is there some concrete application that you would like to solve a problem? And only by knowing or being able to estimate uh, the nuclear dimension of a sister algebra, that's not good enough. But if you, if you can do it for a Kuhn semigroup, well, yes, then you are done, it works. Well, for instance, having dimension zero is, is slightly larger than, uh, not larger, but um, it, it is, for instance, an interesting property for Kuhn semigroups. Mm -hmm. So maybe simply studying one Kuhn semigroup has dimension zero with mm -hmm. some restrictions on the sister algebra might lead into, into some properties of, of the sister algebra itself, which is not the same as of the nuclear dimension. Mm. Right. One main uh, motivation is definitely to go beyond nuclear sister algebras also. I mean, yeah. I guess nuclear sister algebras, we're at a stage where we understand them very well, right? The classification is sort of finished. And uh, I mean, if you want to study now simple sister algebras, which are not nuclear, and group sister algebras are good examples. Um, uh, I mean, we have to find maybe other dimension theories. Uh, nuclear dimension, only works for nuclear sister algebras, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, well, I mean, I mentioned this one example, the, the reduced group sister algebra of the free group on infinitely many generators, but that, that's only going to be, I guess, the first example of many to come where we can use this theory to, to say something. And uh, I mean, the low dimension of the consumer group, I mean, it tells you something about Reese properties and regularity properties. And this is, I guess it's also connected to the Thomson winter conjecture. Uh, so that's also- What conjecture, sorry, what conjecture? The Thomson winter conjecture. Ah, Thomson winter, okay. Right, so this conjecture that says that we know exactly when a simple nuclear sister algebra is classifiable by the Elliott invariant. Uh, it's supposed to happen exactly if the Kunstner group is almost unperforated. And uh, so it's supposed to be encoded in the Kunzumi group. And low dimensionality of the Kunzumi group, uh, we also consider this, uh, I mean, every dimension theory, right? I mean, having low dimension is a, is a nice property, right? I mean, having real rank zero is, is much better than having real rank one. And stable rank one is much better than stable rank two and so on. So having a low dimension of the Kunzumi group, that's, that's going to be a, a regularity property, an interesting property, um, specifically dimension zero, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is a very beautiful answer, indeed. I, I, I noted that in, in a number of the theorems that Edouard was showing, uh, no nuclearity was assumed. Mm -hmm. okay. and, 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 and indeed, yeah, yeah, this, this is a very, very convincing argument if you, if you uh, want to go beyond nuclear sister algebras, that's exactly where, where nuclear dimension is useless and here you can have something meaningful. So that, that, and, and, and then classifiability, that's an important question. Okay, I, I'm very happy with the answer. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. This, uh, this is a you know, big motivation. I have a following um, a suggestion. Uh, I suggest uh, that we still uh, ask some questions to Edward. I'm sure there are still some questions. And then, uh, and what may, I remember that you had some beautiful slide on Friday that you didn't show today. So that would be an idea to- oh, okay. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, but first let's do the questions. Uh, okay. uh, I, I have one more question, but maybe I shouldn't be the first one. Anybody else, any questions? If Mark, I go one. ahead. Okay, so I have a question. Um, what mappings between, um, between algebras, sister algebras, uh, induce um, induce um, homomorphism of, of Kuhn's, uh, Kuhn's uh, semigroups. You mean beyond star homomorphisms? Beyond star homomorphisms. Well, as far as I know, the only ones that are known to, to induce homomorphisms are star homomorphisms. But if you weaken the fact that it's a star homomorphism. So for instance, if you take CPC zero maps yes. or the zero maps, 
then you do not get a zeomorphism, but you get something that's called a generalized zeomorphism. So it's mainly the, the definition of a generalized zeomorphism is, let me go here, is exactly the same as, as that of a zeomorphism, but the only difference is that you may not preserve the compact containment relation. So if you have a, a CPC order zero map, then you get a map between Kuhn semigroups that preserves well, the order, I, I mean, the addition, the order, well, supreme of increasing uh -huh. sequences, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the second question is uh, how to relate this CU to K theory? For instance, if we have a map, star homomorphism inducing uh, inducing an isomorphism of uh, Kuhn semigroups, does it imply that it must uh, induce uh, an isomorphism of K theories? No, normally, so K1 is not inside in any sort ah, of it's the Kuhn semigroup. Only, yeah. So, so what yeah, about K0? K0? Well, you you do have uh, the Murray von Neumann semigroup always inside the Kuhn semigroup, mm -hmm. since the in the when it comes to projections, the, the Kuhn superquivalence is the same as the Murray von Neumann superquivalence. So then, yeah, in, in some cases, you do have an isomorphism on K0. Okay. Uh, very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. I asked Mark. a question. Go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, um, shouldn't a dimension theory uh, say something about what happens to the analog of taking the Cartesian product of two compact spaces? And do you have any conjectures as to what that might be? Now, this is tensor products, of course. Yeah, yeah. So you mean a conjecture on what the dimension of the consumer group of, of the tensor product should be? Yeah. And yes. now, because you go beyond nuclear, you also have to say yes. for which tensor product. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, so, so yeah, in here I only stated the question. So let's say the, the spatial tensor product. And with, as far as I know, the, the only thing that we sort of ask is if, if that bound, the, the nuclear dimension bound, works. But we, we do not have an actual hypothesis on what that dimension might be. Or even if there is a bound, then which bound we might be there. Okay. Thank you. I, I want to say uh, that also for the real rank or the stable rank, we, we don't really know any such uh, results. I mean, um, so there's no general formula, right? Telling me that the, the real rank of A tensor B is uh, I don't know, the real rank of A plus the real rank of B. And I also don't think for the stable rank, uh, although they are kind of non commutative dimension theories, right? And how about the nuclear dimension? Then yes, that would yes, yeah. have it. They would have that that bound, which I where is it? Uh, this one. Oh yes, yes, yes. And then you said that it holds for nuclear dimension. Oh, okay, so actually this is a, an answer to Mark's question. Well, that's your conjecture. Just like yeah, yeah, exactly. But we I so we do not have counterexamples for this, but there is no reason to believe that this. Yeah. Works. Okay. That's okay. That was my point. Yeah. 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 It's a question of the conjecture. I understand. Yes. Exactly. You, you don't insist that it's true, but but you you don't know of it being false. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Sorry, but the expectation is that you have on the right hand side some expression mm -hmm. involving dimensions of C of A and dimension of C of B. So for instance, the finiteness, at least the finiteness is if dim C U of A is finite, the dim C U of B is finite, then mm. necessarily the dim C U of a tensor product is finite. No, we no. do not know this. Mm -hmm. I think I think I look into this briefly, but even if the dimension of C U of B is zero, it's not so clear. Mm -hmm. So so there are examples of uh well, yes, of course. Yeah. Oh, sorry. They are of rearing zero C star algebras whose tensor product does not have rearing zero. So that gives you some uh, uh -huh. taste at the problems that can occur. And the example is actually very easy. I think it's just you take B of H, uh -huh. minimal tensor product with B of H, 
and that does not have rearing zero, although B of H as a phenomenon algebra does have rearing zero. So um, that also shows you that this formula down there does not uh, hold for the rearing. Uh, and okay, I mean, it shows you that, that some things are complicated with non commutative dimension theories. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What can be said about this inequality if um, one of algebras is uh, commutative? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that one can say much. I mean, of course, not know that it is true or no, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, one can use the, the nuclear dimension bound, and then you do get that, that this is bounded by the nuclear dimension of A plus 1 times the dimension of X, where X is the, the space of the commutative system algebra plus 1 minus 1. But that's sort of cheating, right? Since we are using the nuclear yeah. dimension. Okay, thank you. And how about Morita equivalence? When you stabilize your sister algebra, how does the influence best dim CU? So if two are Morita equivalent, then the, the Kunsen group is the same. I, I mean, the dimension of the Kunsen group is the same. It's the same, yeah. Yes. It was, it was defined by the stabilization, yes? That's ah, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the very definition, yes. So, yeah, I forgot it, yes. It was on Friday, yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? I have a question about this R multiplication. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by natural compatibility conditions? Right, so for instance, if you have, so R is a, is a CEO semi group, but it's actually something more. Um, so it's a CEO semi group with, with some special conditions, let's say. And so we have that, we say that another CEO semi group has R multiplication. If you can define a scalar multiplication between, I mean, from R and S, right? So, for instance, a compatibility condition would be that if you have an element way below another one in R, and also two elements one way below the other in the CU semi group that has R multiplication, then doing that product also gives you a way below relation, so a compact containing relation. So, this is something like a by character on this. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, preserving also compatible also with uh, an order. What? Sorry. Say it again, Tomek. I didn't get it. So, uh, can we think about this uh, scalar multiplication as a kind of, of a bi character of this, of this semi group? Yeah, yeah. So, I got that one, but I, I didn't know. Which is, which is, com which is compatible with uh, the order. Yeah, it's compatible with every, yeah, yeah. in every yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, variable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for instance, if you have a CU semi group with R multiplication, and in the in the original CU semi group, you have that something is below something else, then multiplying by things in the in this CU semi group R does not change that. Oh, so it, so this is absorbing with respect to some fixed. R. No, 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 no. I, I mean no, that. So. What, what yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you have, say, a CU semi group S, and in that CU semi group, you have that X is less than or equal to Y, uh -huh. then for some R in R, if you multiply those two elements and you get R times X and R times Y, you still get that R times X is less than or equal than R times Y. Mm -hmm. Like with positive numbers, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. But stomach, what you wanted? Uh, yes, but but it's not what uh, I suspected uh, uh, from this name, a scalar multiplication. But okay, I understand what is this about. Okay, thank you. All right, anybody else? Adam? So maybe one more question. Do you have any example uh, where uh, you, in fact, cannot compute the whole Kuhn semi group, but still you can say that the dimension is, is some number. Yeah. 
for instance, this. So what one? Oh, okay, in general for, for the nuclear. Okay, but not okay, but not using this theorem. <laughs> um, let me think. Well, yeah, for instance, if you have a z-stable sister algebra, then you do not necessarily know how to compute, or maybe let's say an, an omega-stable sister algebra. So a sister algebra that absorbs tensorially the Jason Rasak algebras. You do not necessarily know what that what that quantum group is, but mm -hmm. you still have that dimension zero. Yes, it was mentioned that this quantum group is notoriously difficult to compute, but yeah. the dimension is much easier. Yes, well, maybe not much easier, but it, it's it's easier at least mm -hmm. in the sense that you only look at at one specific aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, thank you. No question. This reminds me somehow uh, about your definition of softness. Could we go back there? It yes. looks quite yeah, yeah. exciting and I would love to have it a bit more exemplified. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. so you call it soft because uh, if you have something below it, then you can still squeeze as I imagine when you exactly. push like exactly. into the pillow with this plus T exactly. and it will still be accommodated. Yes, so for, for instance, if if you take the quantum group of a sister algebra, then the class of a projection is not soft because a projection is, is way below itself. Yes. You cannot squeeze anything. Yes. So that this happens because I'm, I'm asking T to be not zero. Yeah, but what I have to see is, is, is I mean, let's take some, um pretty understandable uh, sister algebra uh, with a pretty understandable Kuhn semigroup and mm -hmm. then can we see what uh what is this soft uh, subset right so for for what for is instance, the software of such a sister algebra yeah yeah so for instance for for simple weakly conservative um semi semigroups so um, by this i mean for Kuhn semigroups of simple stable rank one sister algebras mm -hmm. one notes that the Kuhn semigroup of A either contain so only contains compact elements, so elements, if you will, coming from projections, and elements that are soft. Okay. But, so that, that's not generally the case, but there are instances where you, you can sort of create a disjoint union in the Kuhn semigroup and say there are some that are way below themselves, and the other ones behave like this. Mm -hmm. But still, I would like to see. Uh, in a concrete uh, cone semi-group, uh, an example of a soft element, because it's something I can touch, I can take it to my hand yeah, and hold. Yeah, yeah, so for instance, in this your semi-group, every element is soft, in this one. Yeah. Since being way below is, is being strictly less. And up above, it's infinity, right? Sorry? Is infinity soft in the first example? No, so we, um, yes, yeah, yeah. So in here, the only soft element is infinity. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in here, every element is. So okay. If you take the Jiangsu algebra, for instance. Okay. Then uh, the unit of the Jiangsu algebra is a projection. So it gives you a compact element in the quantum group. But then uh, take a positive element with connected spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, the interval. That will always give you a soft uh, Kunz class. And in the simple case, so for simple sister algebras, the Kunz classes are either compact or they're soft. Actually, there's a dichotomy somewhere between these two. Things. Wait, 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 because it sounds very interesting. So, so should I think about uh, as a model, perhaps, of a soft element, that, that this is a positive element uh, in a sister algebra with a connected spectrum? Yeah, that's exactly what you said. Wow. So that, that's the, this is the kind of intuition I was looking for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the non simple case, you have to be a little careful. Uh -huh. The spectrum is connected, but it also stays connected when you go to any quotient of the C star algebra. So, um, but in the simple case, it's just that. I mean, in the simple case, it's the, it's the connected spectrum, but not just, you know, a singleton, but uh, like an interval. Uh, and in the non-simple case, you want that, but you also want that when, whenever you pass to a quotient of the C-style algebra. 
Uh -huh. so, so if I understand correctly, what, what happens is the following. I have something connected to, in some space, but when I partition the space into a bunch of subspaces, of course, I can imagine a partition so that when, when I restrict my uh, connected subspace to, to one element of this partition, this is no longer connected. That's easy to imagine. Mm -hmm. And and then you translate it into ideals and quotients and so on. And uh, OK. Okay, I think I, 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 I've got some intuition again. Okay, uh, Richard, you didn't ask any question today. No, I don't really have any. Okay. Uh, so let me you have a question. Yes. Uh, can you bound uh, this dimension um, in, for for a cross product in in terms of uh, dimensions of the algebra and some dimension of a group. Well, this was my question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, we we haven't looked into this, so mm -hmm. the answer is that we do not know. But... Okay, thank you. We, in a way, of course, uh, the reason why uh, um, I hesitated uh, from uh, you know asking this question immediately was. Uh, well, I take it back. What I want, really wanted to say was that that in the, of course tensor product is is an example of uh, of 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 a cross product, right? Where you have trivial action. Mm -hmm. So if you cannot say much about the cross product, the, the tensor product, how can you say something about uh, about the cross product? But on the other hand, uh, the, one of the sister algebras that you have over there is not general, right? This is this is a, a group sister algebra. But we, Paul asked you a question about groups in algebra. It, it's again, it's not so obvious what you get as as this DMCU. Mm -hmm. So, so this looks like a, a tough cookie. But I, I cannot resist uh, the following question. I, I'm much more interested in you know dynamical systems than sister algebras themselves. I mean, sister dynamical system, quantum group sister dynamical systems. And uh, for instance, for us, it, it turned out it was a, a real blessing to realize that people were doing uh, the Rockland dimension their life long uh, in classification theory uh, and in Minster, I just bumped into it. And this was a revelation because this is what allowed us to solve a long-standing problem of what local triviality means for compact quantum principle bundle. And it was totally different technology, which we never thought about in the realm of quantum groups acting on sister algebras. Uh, so so I'm, uh, to cut the long story short, I'm, I'm very much interested if you uh, have any equivalent version. So, so you know, uh, it, you have nuclear dimension and then you have a Rockland dimension. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, like heavy, it's, it, ha having this additional action of the group on a sister algebra taken into account. All right, and you have many inequalities uh, relating the nuclear dimension of your sister algebra, or maybe even cross product uh, with a Rockland dimension mm -hmm. of the action of a group on a sister algebra, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Do we have any dynamical picture in here? Can you say, all right, so here we have this DMC dimension, but now I'll be acting on my sister algebra, and now I will have my, I don't know, C Rockland dimension, Kuhn's Rockland dimension. So we do not, but this is actually something that I wanted to look into. So taking this definition and somehow, let's say, changing it in the same fashion as, as what's done with Rockland dimension. Wow, so this wasn't a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or um, <clears throat> For group C star algebras, let's say for locally compact groups or discrete groups, there is reduced C star algebra, but then there is the max C star algebra. Can this dimension be different for the reduced and the max? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. There yeah, also I are many intermediate ones <laughs> between <laughs> the <reduced. laughs> Right. Well, okay. All right. So this is not known at the uh, right now. It's yeah. not known. For the free group, uh, for the free one, group, yeah. right? Again, the reduced one, we know the dimension is one, but the four one has dimension infinity because every C star algebra is a quotient of that. Oh, every so the answer is yes, that it's going to be different. Is, yes. Every, every step of the C star yeah. algebra is a quotient. This can, of, be very, this can be quite different, then. It can be, yeah. Can be made reduce that max uh, C star algebra. I see. Okay. Thank you. Very good. 
all Kun semi groups would be quite different as well, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you mean the projection theory of the can be quite different. It's quite sure. different. Yes, yes. Uh huh. Oh, sorry. So in particular, we have an example where this dimension, this Kuhn's dimension, is infinite. Yes. The, right, the universal, the universal sister algebra. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah it's completely okay. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yes, yes, you asked yeah, this yeah. question in the middle. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay, guys. So we happily reached the end of the uh, seminar. <laughs> so you don't have to flash your your Friday slide. Uh, let me ask one more time: Are there any questions? I don't see any raised hands. Any questions, comments, okay. suggestions? Well, if not, let us uh, thank Edward uh, again for a very beautiful talk. This is a very yep. interesting story. And actually, thank you to both of us guys because the talk was by Edward, but, but, but this is your joint research. So uh, really, I, I applaud both of you because, uh, because this is very interesting stuff. And, and I like these accents for abstract dimension theory. And uh, it seems that this is a, a well worth digging into. So, so there might be some fresh water inside. So that's, uh, uh, or gold better still, you know. So thank you very much, guys. And I stop recording now. Where is the button?